My guest today is Alex Tabarrok, the Bartley J. Madden Chair in Economics at the Mercatus Center and Professor of Economics at George Mason University, blogger at MarginalRevolution.com, co-founder of Marginal Revolution University, and co-author with Eric Helland of Why Are the Prices So Damn High, which is a short, free book, and we'll be discussing that today, among many other things. Alex, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Economics, I think, is unusual among social sciences because the object of its study, being the economy, has a measurable magnitude and a pretty obvious direction of progress, I think, which is that more growth is better. So does this mean that contribution to economic growth is the most important thing economists can do? And maybe what do you think is the most economically impactful idea that you've worked on yourself? So I think one of the most important uh, ideas that I've worked on is actually the simplest, um, and that's the textbook. Okay. Um, Tyler and I wrote a textbook of economics, and, of course, a lot of what we do on uh, Marginal Revolution and Marginal Revolution University is teach economics. Yep. And in one way, that's uh, not very impactful. Other people do it. You know, the ideas have been around. But I sort of think that a lot of the world has not yet caught up with Adam Smith. And so that by teaching the, the basic truths uh, actually go a long way. Uh, the very first course you take in economics is probably the most important course mm. uh, you'll ever take. And the principles of economics, understanding when the invisible hand works, uh, which is when self-interest is channeled towards the social good. That is like a fundamental insight, which a lot of the world still has not fully absorbed. And so I enjoy teaching that. And indeed, I get, you know, uh, emails from students all over the world uh, who have learned from some of these materials. And that's very gratifying. Mm. What, what are we making progress on those questions? So on the, the lessons of Adam Smith, is, is, is it sinking in at all? <laughs> I mean, it must be on some, on some level. I mean, you, you have a job today. Economists didn't exist when Adam Smith was around. So definitely direction is positive. Yeah, I think the direction is definitely positive. I mean, just take a look at what has happened in China since the death of Mao uh, towards a turn towards a, a more market economy. And that has lifted more people out of poverty than anything else has ever happened in the entire history of the world. Mm. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have been lifted above absolutely abject levels of poverty. We're talking in 1970 in China, $400, $500 uh, GDP per capita per year. So this is really the lowest level of, uh, that a human being can survive at. And, you know, today China is looking more like $15,000 uh, GDP per capita. So just a tremendous increase in human welfare. And we're seeing the same thing beginning a little bit later, but beginning in the 1990s in India. And so I think that has been a, uh, a tremendous uh, advance all over the world. How, how much of that is self-aware in the sense of these are economies and these are people in these countries are changing their behaviors to a more market-oriented kind of kind of process, I guess, or, or, or the way they live their lives. Do they know it? Do they understand it? Do the countries even understand it? Because, you know, you see, you see sort of the pendulum swinging back and forth occasionally, and there's protectionism, and it's certainly a topical thing here in, in 2019. And one of the things I wonder about is how much of it is just emulation of other people that work and we don't quite understand it, and how much of it is a conscious march towards more, more open markets? Yeah, I think a lot of it is emulation. Um, the United States had the very great fortune of achieving its independence, uh, 1776, at the very time that classical liberal ideas were in the ascendancy. So this was also the year that Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations. But these ideas about property rights, about uh, freedom of expression uh, and markets uh, and so forth, that was what was in the air uh, right. when we had the American uh, Revolution of Independence. Uh, China and India, in, in contrast, uh, had their independence post-World War II when the ideas which were in the ascendant at the time were uh, much more socialist uh, mm -hmm. ideas. Um, you know, the idea was that free trade was bad, that you wanted to protect your uh, infant industries, that um, you wanted to have a large role of government, even in the market economies. You wanted to have a large role of government 
um, to uh, you know avoid externalities and so forth, to create better divisions, to avoid the Great Depression. You know, you needed the markets were blamed for the Great Depression. So India and China are having their independence at a time where all where there are all these anti-market ideas, and that showed and 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 that was to their detriment. Um, and so those economies did not grow for a long time until you began to see in the 1970s kind of the renaissance with Mont Pelerin and uh, kind of the pushback with Reagan, with Thatcher, Mulroney in Canada. This turn back towards uh, markets. Hayek gets the Nobel Prize in 73, 74, something like that. I'm not saying that all these are, there's a, there's a direct connection, but it's more that in all the world at the same time, you see things beginning to move in a different direction, and China and India finally benefit from that. It feels like more than a coincidence. That, that, that whole progression really amazes me. What if a, so let's say a new country gets born today. What, what, do you think, what do you think it will be? Like, what's the environment now? Yeah, I'm worried. Yeah, yeah I'm definitely worried. Yeah. Um, because... You know, really throughout my lifetime as a, you know, academic or, you know, a person interested in ideas beginning, you know, in my uh, teenage years, um, I've seen an upward progression. Mm -hmm. You know, the classical liberals were always in the minority, but we were growing. Right. And now the classical liberals are in the minority and they're shrinking. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm worried that we are going to forget all of the hard lessons that we won um, in, in the past. And that, you know, we are seeing a rise of authoritarianism, um, both on the right and on the left. And uh, classical liberal ideas are kind of being uh, scrunched uh, in the middle, attacked by both sides. How much of this is a cyclical, t you know, like I was saying earlier, the pendulum swinging back and forth? And how, how much of this is, you know, kind of a trend line? Any, what do you think? That's a hard one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think people are never happy, right? Yeah, right, <laughs> you, know, right. You, you can never seem to satisfy them uh, for long. So there is something, and people get used to things. I mean, so it's, so if you take it on a worldwide scale, the turn to classical liberal ideas to more free markets and free trade and globalization has just been immensely successful. Yep. Um, everything that uh, Hayek and Friedman said would happen uh, did happen. Uh, the world has become a much more peaceful place and a much uh, richer uh, place. Um, but there has been this um, uh, kickback, uh, pushback um, in some parts of the West, despite the fact that the United States today is richer than it has ever been, and the same is true for Europe. So what's causing this this current kickback? Well, one of the one of the ways that I like to try and think about things is reduce it to really economic growth, <laughs> wealth generation. So m maybe one th hypothesis here is this is a reaction to to what what Tyler's called the Great Stagnation, and uh, you've you've commented on on that and similar phenomena. Is is that the is that the underlying cause? Are we not doing good enough in growth? It's definitely the case that the faster you're growing. The bigger the pie is growing, the less the, the fighting over the dividing the pie, right? Yep. And that is when, and that is what we're seeing, I think, in a lot of ways. With slower growth, there's a lot more emphasis on, you know, intellectual property, for example, copyright and patents and things, and these are all about dividing the pie. And think about the debates we had over uh, healthcare in the United States. Almost all of the debates over Obamacare. No matter which side you were on, it was all about dividing the pie. There was very little debate about, well, how much should we put into research and development, mm. right? Um, how much for the NIH uh, to develop new cures uh, for diseases? You know, everything was about uh, how much, you know, for the poor, for Medicaid and, and Medicare and the old and so forth. It was about, like, how much wealth is going to be redistributed. Very, very little debate about how much are we going to spend on creating a cure for cancer or developing new uh, antibiotics and things of that nature. And I think that's really uh, frightening in a way because when all of your debates are about dividing the pie, then uh, 
You're taking your eye off the ball. You're exactly. You're taking your eye off the ball. You're taking your eye off the ball because uh, growing the pie is the only way everyone can win. Yeah. Has the has the the rhetoric the 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 debate ever really been about growing the pie? Is that something that gets debated, or is that something that just kind of happens and everybody is okay with it? It might not be explicit, but I think there is is a feeling, and, and maybe I'm just getting old and. Uh, uh, you know, look back with, you know, uh, 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 rose-colored glasses at the past. But it seems, for example, that it's a little bit of a cliche, but think back to going to the, to the moon, right? Sure. Um, that was a very forward-thinking, very exciting. It was about growth. It was about spending money. We, and we spent a huge amount of money, um, you know, going to the moon. Uh, something like 10%, uh, I think is at the highest... 12% of the U.S. budget was going to NASA. And that's, like, inconceivable today. That is, in, that is incredible. I yeah, that. yeah. I, I mean, that we would spend that much on unproven future technologies. Um, so it does seem that in the past we were, we had a, a capability as a nation of coming together in an optimistic way to do something which has never been done before. And I'd like to see more of that, but it's it's very it's very difficult. So, how much of of our willingness to push ourselves comes from competition? In the case of of NASA, very much a competitive. That in that case, it wasn't explicitly militaristic, but it kind of implicitly. So, yeah, right, rocket technology and the like, and and so a rivalry will generate some kind of technological externality. What do you is that? Do, yeah. we, do we need a rival? So uh, absolutely. We're staring yeah. this China-U.S. kind of tension in the face, and everybody's worried, but it might ultimately become a good thing. Right, yes, yes. I'm very, I am optimistic or hopeful uh, that China-U.S. rivalry can be channeled in productive, in a productive dimension. Yeah. So, for example, I'm kind of excited that, you know, the Chinese, for example, um, you know, did these experiments with uh, changing the genetics of kids, sure, right? Yeah. It's a little bit frightening, okay? Yeah. A little bit scary or whatever, right? Yeah. But um, that, that kind of is going to light, I hope, a fire uh, under us saying, look, we, we got to be on board with these future technologies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because changing uh, genes, uh, that's the only way we're going to keep up with the robots. Sure, yeah. Right? And so artificial intelligence and uh, genetic engineering, I think these technologies are immensely promising and may even be able to change humanity itself. But in order to do that, uh, we're going to have to need a rival who we fear is going to get there before us, mm, right? Mm. I mean, if the Chinese, the Chinese are spending a lot on how to raise IQ. Uh, what are the genes for IQ? And uh, if we get frightened of that, uh, then we might put some more efforts into that uh, in the in the United States. And I think overall that would be a good thing. So, so bring it back to like a grassroots level, because this is this is the, you know the big picture supporting innovation on the, on the state level. But you, you wrote a paper asking the question: Is entrepreneurship in decline? Is it? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it is. Um, you know, there's been a long-term trend uh, in a variety of measures of dynamism uh, in the U.S. economy, uh, which includes like new startups. The number of startups as a share of firms uh, is way down. Um, startups used to account for a small but significant share of all employment, like uh, 12%, uh, 10%, something like that. That's now way down. Um, the you know, contrary to popular belief, we're, we're told that today, you know, people are going to have 10 jobs and they're going to change careers much more often than in the past. That's just not true. Mm. That is just not true. Um, actually, we are changing careers less often. And more and more people today work for a big firm. Um, for almost the, for really the very first time, a majority of Americans work for firms which are big is like you know 500 people or or, or more, um, and in, in one way that's great. You know it provides uh, stability and so forth. And uh, big firms tend to have you know higher pay packages, and you know there are benefits to all of that. But it does mean that there's less creative destruction. Uh, 
there's less entrepreneurship going on. And that is, I think, uh, uh, worrying. So that that's one, one really interesting point that, that I liked in that paper that you made was, call it drawing a distinction between three different things. So entrepreneurship, uh, startups, right, which is not quite the same as entrepreneurship, and, and let's say productivity growth, right? So those are those are things which can get commingled a little bit in our thinking, but actually represent distinct phenomena. And one, one observation you made in that paper which I thought was really neat was it, the rate growth of startups is not necessarily causing entrepreneurship and causing growth because you go to some very poor countries and there's startups everywhere, right? right? There's entrepreneurship is, 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 is just everywhere all the time and people are selling fruit on the, on the side of the road. That's not necessarily a good thing, though. That's not what we want. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, so... That's exactly right. I spent time in India um, where, exactly as you say, uh, there are lots of small firms because people are working for themselves. Yeah. And they do that because they have no choice. Yeah. Uh, because the labor market is so poor that firms cannot get big and so you don't have any stable employment. So part of this is, you know, a, a good thing. The worrying part, and it, so if that was all we were seeing, I would be less worried. What is worrying is that the decline of startups and the fact that people are changing jobs less often is occurring at the same time as productivity growth has been going down. Now, it might be that those two things are unrelated. Yeah. It could even be, potentially, that you know um, this is a, a, a good thing, uh, all, all considered. Um, but the fact that both of these trends are happening at the same time is at least suggestive that the decline in dynamism is one of the causes or perhaps is being caused by the decline in kind of basic productivity growth. There's, there's a, a criticism often, well, let's, maybe not even a criticism, but a, a concern, a worry, an anxiety that, it, that this is about big firms or monopolies, right? They're constraining economic growth. They're holding us back. Lots of talk of of the I mean I forget what the acronym is now GAFA AGA or something the you know the Fang. big the Fang right and do you what do you think about that do you think that there's there's something to those arguments are are these organizations monopolistic are they are they hoarding resources and and what evidence do we have of whether that's a real concern yeah, I'm not worried about bigness per se and I do think it's very strange to be going after Fang, which is Facebook, Amazon, Apple, uh, Apple, Net Netflix, Google? Uh, Netflix, and Google. Yes, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because these are the big successes, right? right? These are the firms which are not only American successes but are world successes. So why are you going after the place where there does seem to be a lot of dynamism, where there does seem to be a lot of growth, where um, there does seem to be a lot of uh, incredible creation of consumer value. I mean, I love Netflix. Um, I love uh, Amazon. Uh, these are actually... They're awesome companies. They're awesome companies. They really are. These are awesome companies. So it seems crazy to be going after them. Instead, where I see the uh, big uh, welfare losses is in, like, land management. Okay? So we have a situation where you can't build, you know, three-story housing in San Francisco. Um, this is completely insane that we have um, closed off, we have walled off our most successful uh, cities and are preventing any building from going on. So it's not the new firms, it's not the new technologies where the problems are, it's the old sectors of the economy, particularly um, in management of land and housing, that the really huge uh, welfare losses are, are, are happening, which is just dividing our side. It is creating inequality, and it is meaning that a huge portion of the benefits to the dynamism which is happening is flowing to absentee landlords. Hmm. Is there, is there a, a firm size dynamic to, to that problem? And so one, one way of thinking about that is there aren't really, are there, I don't know that there are any very large commercial land developers, call, call it kind of like the FANG scale sort of thing. This is much more regional right. development uh, there. Right, right, right. Yeah, there's no, the problem is with um, housing policy is there's no big single evil landlord to point one's finger to 
and say, Jeff Bezos, let's get him, or yeah. something like that. Instead, the problem is us. Instead, the problem is, is that when we decide to make decisions collectively uh, in our neighborhoods and in our cities, uh, collectively we act uh, to preserve, to conserve, to preserve, to be against, this, to keep the status quo. So nobody wants, you know, ever people fear um, a, an apartment going up. Uh, oh, traffic is going to be so bad, right? Or the fear, oh, a Walmart is going to come. That'll lower, you know, our property values. Or these other people are going to, these foreign people, uh, different people, they're going to come and live next door to us. People don't say that quite openly, but that's what they mean, <laughs> right? These odd-looking people with their funny-smelling cooking, and, you know, they're going to move next door to us and, you know, going to ruin our, ruin our lives. And the problem is, is we have given so much power to collective decision-making that when millions of communities make decisions in this way, there is no longer any space to grow. You know, we have closed it off. And the, the real difficulty is precisely that no politician or few politicians are going to go after this problem because the problem is homeowners, the problem is us. The problem is not someone you can point to and say, let's take what they have, you know, let's go after this rich guy. The problem is these decisions we have made in our local communities which prevent growth. You know, it is interesting. I hadn't really even thought about it so much this way, but there is a lack of, of call it national scale, Maybe because it's not a national scale problem, really, the, the, that, that housing prices are too high, because it really isn't a few isolated cities. Probably has a disproportionate impact on economic growth because those are the most productive cities and the most innovative cities. But you don't, you don't get the feeling that this is something that, that is, a, is called a presidential scale uh, debate. Right, right. It, it, right. They, I guess they won't really influence it. I mean, what would a president do about right. this? I don't even know. Yeah. Maybe nothing. Yeah, I, I mean, y you're right. It doesn't, it, on the one hand, it doesn't seem like a national uh, issue. And yet the work which economists have done suggests that this is by far the biggest I issue in the economy over the last 30 years. Mm. That the if the estimate is, and I'll... I'll paraphrase a little bit here, but this is approximately what it says. Um, the estimate says basically that if every community had more or less the sort of housing policy of Houston or something like that, you know, one of the uh, uh, Texas, uh, uh, Austin, Texas, or something like that, that a GDP today would be like 30 percent higher. Wow. Uh, yeah, that we would have grown much faster. Wow. GDP would be much higher, and that's just like moving to sort of the mean level. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because the the big constraints have been in the fastest growing, most important cities, not the fastest growing, the most important cities. Yeah. One thing that we do see in the national debate, of course, is 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 a quite I don't know fraught discussions of prices in healthcare and education. If we could maybe touch on the on your recent book. Uh, maybe outline the arguments uh, in why are the prices so damn high, which prices are so high, and why do we care? Right. So there are these big, long-run trends where uh, education and healthcare, in particular just seem to go up in price every single year. And people have been complaining about this for a long time. You can go back 50 years ago, and people are talking about out of control college costs. Yeah. Out of control health care costs. That's amazing. Yeah, you can yeah. go back a hundred years ago. Yeah. I love people, doing that. Yeah. You know, kids these days there's some arguments that were much more they're just sort of universal and I guess. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, and it's not just that, it's also the arts are getting more expensive. Um, you know, there's interesting that for example, cars have gotten much, much cheaper, but car repair has gotten more expensive. Mm. Right, so what's going on there? So um, Eric Helen and I decided to take a look at this, and going in, I thought, well, it's some combination of regulation, monopoly, some th things of the sort of traditional explanations like that, bloat. Um, 
Plus, there's something uh, uh, about the, what's called the Bommel effect. And after writing the paper, I think actually mostly it's the Bommel effect. Um, uh, these other explanations, they don't work over that long a time scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Bommel effect is a deep uh, kind of fundamental driver which has very little to do with policy and in many ways is actually a good thing. Do explain. Okay. <laughs> so let me give you the classic story to explain the Bommel effect. The classic story might not be the necessarily the best one, but I'm going to give you the classic story, which is take uh, a Beethoven string quartet in 1826. It takes four people 40 minutes to perform that string quartet. Now, do the same thing today. It still takes four people 40 minutes to perform exactly the same string quartet. So in nearly 200 years, there has been zero improvement in productivity in string quartet playing. On the other hand, there are many, many other sectors of the economy where productivity has increased tremendously you know, in producing goods, automobiles, for example, in producing major appliances in all of the areas which have made life so much better uh, compared to 1826. So if we go back to 1826 and we then compare what's the cost of performing the string quartet? And by cost, I mean here what the economist calls the opportunity cost. What do we lose? What does society lose when we have an additional performance of a Beethoven string quartet piece? Well, society loses four people doing something for 40 minutes. But in 1826, productivity in car production was so low, and in other areas of the economy was so low, that that's a low opportunity cost. Okay, you're not giving up a lot because those guys are not very productive in producing goods. They couldn't produce a lot in you know, uh, four of them at 40 minutes. If you come today, four people at 40 minutes, they can produce a lot. Uh, they can produce some goods which are really valuable. It's gone, in terms of wages, it's gone from an opportunity cost of about $3 in 1826 to more like $70 uh, today at average wages. So the cost, the opportunity cost, what we give up to get this string quartet has gone up precisely because other sectors of the economy have become more productive. So anytime you have a stagnant sector, a sector which grows slowly in productivity, the uh, output of that sector will become more expensive over time, regardless of anything else. It's, it's, a, it's a, a great idea. It's something I'd come across before, but hadn't really uh, studied it, I suppose, so deeply as this. And it's one of the things that's amazing is the, uh, I'm not sure the right way of putting it, is the, the, the frightening effect that you have when you pair the, the Bommel effect with a superior good, <laughs> right? So why don't you describe what is a superior good? And maybe you have a couple examples in the book where you can touch on, on education sure. and healthcare. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, we, we have the Bommel effect. So um, goods which are rising slowly in productivity, which are often labor intensive, right? Like the string quartet, the, the masseuse is not going to get more expensive until we have the robot masseuse. Uh, education is like this as well because, you know, mostly it's a teacher in front of uh, 30 students, and that hasn't changed in, you know, over 100 years. Uh, healthcare often involves a lot of labor. So these goods are becoming more expensive, but it also turns out that, particularly for education and healthcare, uh, we want more of these goods as we get richer. Uh, we get a little bit bored with having too many cars. Uh, you know, you, okay, you've got one car, you've got a second car, but there's really no point having a third. You, you don't have time to drive it, right? Um, you know, we already have Netflix, and there's only so many movies you can watch in a day. So after that, you don't really want more Netflix. So what do you want? Well, it turns out that as society becomes richer, society wants more of the goods like education and health care, which are growing slowly in productivity. 
So in fact, one of the reasons that U.S. growth has slowed, it's that we have shifted our resources towards more slowly growing sectors of the economy. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's just that's our way our preferences are. But it does mean that overall growth declines because we've got lots of cars, we've got lots of goods, and now we're just trying to buy more of the goods which are growing slowly in productivity. It, it, that's so interesting because a victim of your own success in some ways, right? You you wind up doing such a good job at, at squeezing efficiency out of all the, all the goods production, more or less, and services production kind of lagged behind. Maybe it's worthwhile actually touching on, let's say specifically, education, the evidence there, how, how, you, look, how, you, how you evaluated that. I think the main graph in the book is one that just shows spending per student in, in uh, secondary and elementary education. That's just basically been going up for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So in real terms, in 1950, again, you got to look at the book for specifics, so I often forget. But we're talking about, in real terms, in 1950, it cost about $2,500 uh, per student. And today, we're more like $15,000 per student. So it, it's gone up by a factor of uh, certainly more than five, uh, looks like you know, closer to seven. And that's, again, inflation corrected. So the real value of the resources we are using in education has gone up. And again, that makes sense because highly skilled labor has become more valuable in our economy. And uh, education uses a lot of highly skilled labor, but it's doing more or less the same thing that it was doing 100 years ago. You have a you know highly educated professor like myself, okay, and a lot of the time I'm just talking to 10 people in a classroom. You know, I'm not talking to thousands, uh, except when I'm on the podcast. <laughs> I'm talking to 10 people. And that's the same thing that professors were doing 100 years ago. So there's been very little improvement in productivity. People are doing more or less the same thing. But my opportunity cost, the opportunity cost, you know, I could, or people like me, maybe not literally me, but people like me, they could be in the high tech sector. Yep. And so the opportunity cost of that teaching has gone up. One of the things I noticed about the graph there, and I don't think you, 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 touched on it any length in the book, but there, there has been a decline in the last kind of few years, I don't know, seven or eight or nine years or so uh, per student cost. Do you know what's going on there? Yeah, so with, in, in 2000, with the, with the, with the recession, okay. uh, 2008 financial crisis, 2009, uh, amazingly, that recession was so severe that in, for the first time in 50 years, uh, education costs per student actually fell um, because we didn't hire we stopped hiring people right. um, uh, for a short period of time. There's also something else which is going on, and that is that the Baumel effect, because it's about the opportunity cost in other industries, the rising value of uh, skilled labor in other industries increases the price of education and healthcare. The faster productivity is growing in other industries, the worse the so-called cost disease, right? Mm. The faster productivity is growing in the tech sector, the more expensive healthcare and education is going to get. So actually, uh, the cost disease is the sign of a healthy economy. And what we're seeing with the great stagnation, for the reasons also that you pointed out, now we have we've been we're, we are so successful at producing goods that more and more of our resources are going into the slowly progressing sectors, into the stagnant sectors of the economy, that the growth rate is declining, that the cost of these is declining as well. So in other words, the price of education and healthcare isn't rising as fast as it used to. Hmm. It actually rose the fastest in the 1960s. Uh, so we might think that the problem is getting worse, but actually, that problem, if you call it a problem, is slowing, but it's slowing because we're not getting as much progress in other sectors of the economy. So it's unfortunately, overall, not a good sign yeah. that teachers and professors are becoming you know, cheaper. <laughs> yeah. 
another point you make in the book, which I thought was interesting, was was productivity growth is related to to cons- uh, you call it consumer satisfaction, right? So there are some industries we are we are choosing what we want, right? And when we are choosing something that isn't necessarily in the aggregate going to help the statistics, we're still getting what we want. <laughs> yeah. And so in some sense, that is making the economy more productive because we're producing goods that maybe it's not measured by GDP, but, but it's something that, that, that we like. And so we want more of it. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, part of this shift towards the output of slowly growing sectors, as I said, that lowers our GDP, but it's still the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, in the words of a colleague, it's sort of optimal stagnation. Yeah. Um, now, what we would like, of course, is for all sectors uh, to grow faster than they are. But given the constraints that exist, it's better that we follow our preferences and consume more of the slowly growing industries, even if that reduces our GDP growth rate on paper. Hey, one of the things that I was I was just kind of mulling over as I was reading this and after was what's the, what's the kind of big takeaway here? And and here, and here's kind of a a thought that I have on that is that this is in some ways kind of a, although it's a very neutral and and, and neat paper uh, and book, it's actually a kind of a condemnation of our lack of ability to innovate (laughs) in some of these sectors, right? It's saying, well, here's what you get when you don't innovate. It's not just you lose productivity. It's actually, it kind of gets worse or appears to be getting worse at the same time. So do you agree with that? Is, a, is Do you find this a pessimistic kind of enterprise? What what prompted the actual the book? Is there something that made you think about this? You've done a lot of work on innovation. Yeah, innovation probably in the long run is the most important thing. You know, we talked about lifting hundreds of millions of, uh, you know, Chinese and Indians out of poverty. But we also would like to be richer here in the United States. And to do that, we have to push the cutting edge. We have to do things in a new way. Now, I think what this does illustrate and which I don't answer, and which I can't answer, is ultimately why are some sectors of the economy growing slower? Why is it harder to increase productivity in services than in goods? Now, ultimately, this is something of a, of a mystery. It's not regulation. I, I could sort of rule that out. It's not any policy. But there's an example I give in the book, and that is a strawberry production has increased in productivity like a thousand times. I'm probably exaggerating, but many times. Uh, Going back, you can look at the data from 1950 to 2000, 2020. uh, And the amount of strawberries that we can produce from an acre has gone up incredibly. Now, there are these other berries, huckleberries, uh, which I'm told are also great. They're also delicious. Um, You can sometimes get them in the south, but they still have to be picked by hand. And the reason is we have just have not found a way to mass produce huckleberries. Now, why that should be the case is like something to do with genetics and nature and, you know, the land. I don't know. You know, why is, you know, it's like the koala bears. They're like really hard to, or the pandas, you know, the zoos. <laughs> of, all, of all the things you would think that animals should do, like having sex would be like the easiest. But no. <laughs> You know, the panda bears have trouble having sex. So we don't get a lot of panda bear production. We don't get a lot of huckleberry production. Why this is, I'm not totally sure. I can't answer it as an economist. Um, same thing in services generally. Like, why is it difficult to, you know, duplicate the services of a masseuse? You know, we have these chairs, right? But they're just not as good. Yep. You know? no. um, what I'm hoping is that, you know, productivity growth comes in in spurts and what i'm hoping is that what artificial intelligence and robots will do is they make labor more capital like and once we can do that if we can make labor more capital like then all the advantages of productivity in artificial intelligence and in robots which we are going to see will then become advantages in the productivity of services, right? So if you can tie services, if you can tie a good to a progressive sector, then you're home free. So I'm hoping that education, as it becomes more like online education, that means education becomes more tied to things which are improving, 
like the internet and computers. Um, if we can have robots, then we can make service the service side of the economy now advance as quickly as robots. So my most optimistic take is that at least now there appears to be a kind of technology which at least in principle is able to incredibly increase the productivity of services. And so maybe we're in for a big boom. Mm. And uh, we should emphasize that the fact that you don't have any real clean answers for innovation and education is particularly damning because you wrote a book which treated a lot, <laughs> uh, spent a lot of time on innovation and education and a lot of su suggestions, recommendations. What's your view looking back on uh, the book, uh, Launch the Innovation Renaissance? Right. Um, that's published that, was it seven or eight years ago, maybe? Right. Um, maybe you could, if, if, what do you think about that book now, that work now? Right, right. Well, still read it, still buy it. Yeah, definitely. It's <laughs> um, very good. So, you know, one of the things which uh, Tyler and I have tried to do in creating Marginal Revolution University, which is online education videos. This is, we like to be the, the Khan Academy of uh, economics education. So this was part of our vision, is to tie education, in our case, economics education, to a progressive sector. And in many ways it has worked. Um, as I mentioned, we've got thousands and thousands of students all over the world, and, and there have been a lot of interesting things uh, which came out of that. So, so for example, early on, we um, captioned our videos in English. And what we found, to our surprise, we hadn't really planned on this, is that as soon as you caption, caption the videos in English, Google automatically translates those captions to like 150 languages, you know, wow. <laughs> so automatically. Um, and so what this has meant is that every time Google improves its deep mind algorithms, we automatically get the benefit of that at Marginal Revolution University without us actually having to do anything. So, you know, students all over the world, if they're having trouble uh, with a part of the text, part of the video, they can, you know, look at the captions in their home language, and typically they're not perfect, but they're good enough for the student to get a sense, oh, I see now what they're saying. And so I do think, I still am optimistic about online education. It's more difficult than I had thought to spread it uh, and to get universities involved as widely as I'd hoped. Um, but I think we are moving in that direction. Well, what, what do you think... What have you learned about universities' reluctance and, and maybe the underlying reasons why? What's going on there? So I think two things. Um, one is that places like uh, Harvard, um, they don't really want to do it. They don't want more students, right? I mean, Harvard could have created multiple campuses, you know, across the United States and the world, and they could have done that 50, 100 years ago. But they want to be the place where the elite is going to be educated. And in order to do that, they just have to be small. So Harvard really doesn't want to expand that much. So they're not going to go big into online education. Um, places which have done it are the actual, the for-profit universities like Phoenix. They've put a lot of effort into it, but for other reasons, their quality is low. So I think there's an opportunity for sort of mid-ranked universities, places like uh, George Mason, where I teach, to really expand internationally in this, to create a global brand. Um, but there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy, and it's really uh, difficult. Uh, a lot of, in universities, there are a lot of veto points. Um, so it's a nonprofit, and nonprofits are typically not run as efficiently as for profits. And there's no single person, even the president of the university, cannot just say, let's get it done. There are a lot of veto players, a lot of uh, interests which have to be assuaged, uh, a lot of uh, 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 groups you have to satisfy before you can get it out there. And so uh, we haven't quite moved as fast as I had hoped, but we're still pushing. Mm. And do you... so? Still pushing. That's a note of optimism on that. What do you think the future looks like? What 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 will be the the arrangement of the economic 
education process, just the education process, higher learning, lower learning. What, what's what's the what's going to be the optimal amount of online education? Do you think? So universities are very very successful, and universities are some of our oldest institutions. You know, Oxford University is like over a thousand years old. Um, it's older, I think, pretty much than any firm. Uh, it's older than most countries. Um, so these universities, one should not predict their demise uh, yeah. anytime, anytime soon. You know, Harvard is 400 years old. They're pretty stable. Now, what is happening is that uh, it has become, it has become, and is becoming very common for a student to take at least one online class um, in, in university. So students at George Mason, uh, as well as other places, as well as any place in the United States, most of them will take at least one online class. While they're enrolled at the university. While they're enrolled at a university, exactly. Okay. So it's become more of a complement than a mm. substitute. Mm. And that online class, it might still only have, you know, 50 or maybe 100 students, right? So what we're not seeing mm. is a online four-credit class where you can teach 1,000 students or 10,000 students at once. So... Uh, we're not getting all the full cost benefits that you would if you were able to scale this. Instead, what is happening is that instead of teaching a class of 25 students uh, on campus where you need a classroom and you need physical facilities, we're instead teaching a, student, teaching a class of 25 students online, which helps the university because, you know, they, they, they run out of space, but it doesn't achieve all of the cost benefits which are possible if you would really were to scale it. How much of this is is an innovation problem and how much of it is a governance problem? Right? So have we found the right product? I don't know if online education classes have changed over the last as 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 the market's experimented with it, you guys have experimented with it. Is the best practice in online education kind of the same or is there stagnation in the innovation of online education? Is there more you know, is it a product or is it decision making at universities? It's both because these are really tied together because if you could have, you know, 10,000 students in a single online accredited class, well then it makes sense to spend a million dollars making that a unbelievably advanced and good class. That's like a hundred bucks per student, right? Then the economics of it makes sense. And we've never had in the history of the world, it's never made sense to spend a million dollars to create a class, a, 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 a teaching class. And yet we spend routinely millions of dollars to create a video game, right? So the creators of a video game, they hire uh, voice talent, they hire computer programmers, they hire sound designers, they even hire psychologists who figure out you know, where people get stuck and frustrated in the game, and so they make it so that people are always in that flow level of enjoyment. They're always being challenged, hmm. but they're still moving ahead. So there's a huge amount of effort goes into creating a video game. But a class, like an economics class, Economics 101, that has all of the same economics as the video game, right? It could be online to just as many people. And so we could be spending millions of dollars to create really well fine tuned, brilliant economics classes. But because we haven't got that scale yet, we're not doing that. So we are, it's both governance and innovation. Without the right governance, we're not going to get the economies of scale, mm. which launch you on that innovation mm. trend. How, how would you change the governance? So what, one other area of research for your voting systems. Right, right. right? And yeah. uh, so if you were to design the optimal voting system for governing a university with an eye towards innovation, what would you do? So I'm not sure exactly about the governance, but I will say that I, going back to China and competition, I do think that competition is going to make a really big difference. So the one place which has done this is Georgia Tech. Okay. Um, Georgia Tech has an incredible master's degree in computer science. They are teaching thousands of students. It's the biggest computer science degree um, in the country, indeed in the world, and it is taken excuse me, it is taken 100% seriously. Uh, if you want to hire someone and you, they have a Georgia Tech master's in computer science, no one cares whether it was online or whether the person was like literally there. There's no difference. There's no grading difference. There's no material difference. 
There's no difference on your transcript. They've been very, very successful. So um, I think that that kind of competition is uh, really going to push things. We've only seen it with Georgia Tech and computer science, but it seems to me that that won't stay, it won't stay that way for very long. So, but isn't the underlying problem one of governance though there where, you know, so you have a success and you're saying it's success, sounds like a success to me. Yeah. And we don't even have any, any copiers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, see, there's the roadblock there. And it seems like if the, if the meta problem really is a governance problem here, then, so this is the innovation of the day. And let's say we can crack this one. Virginia Tech just takes over all the universities in the United States, whatever it is. Then the innovation of tomorrow, given that we haven't changed the governance system, won't be adopted either. It'll take too long and, and the rest of it. Can we do anything there? I'm not sure. It's just maybe one of these things where nothing seems to change until everything does very rapidly. Yeah, and yeah. That that's what my I guess that's my hope. Um, but we we can be optimistic, I think, because another another area of your work is is in this city in India. A private city. Mm. I mean, holy cow, that's an experiment you wouldn't have thought would have happened, right? Maybe you can talk a bit about that, uh, what, what sure. that city is and what yeah. you're doing there. So that's Gurgaon in uh, India. And what makes uh, India interesting is that, you know, the world is rapidly urbanizing. And uh, the United States, it's urbanized, the urbanization story is mostly over. Um, you know, some of our big cities are going to grow bigger. But some of the smaller cities are actually going to grow smaller. Um, most people in the United States live in an urban area, and that's not going to change. But in India, depending upon how you measure it, more than half of the people still live in rural areas. So over the next uh, 30 years, India is going to move hundreds of millions of people into cities which do not exist today. So that provides a tremendous opportunity to build new cities with entirely new governance uh, structures. And Gurgaon is one example of that. It was, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, literally just fields. Um, today it is one of the most advanced cities in India with high rises and golf courses and, and you name it. And it's almost entirely privately run. So. It has private security, it has private roads, all of this has been built uh, privately. Um, that has created some tensions. It's difficult, for example, to build private sewage because you have to get everybody to kind of agree. Um, it was, instead you had all of these high rises. Uh, they're wonderful, they're beautiful. And the sewage goes but to the a tank. Don't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. The toilet just sends the garbage to a tank, which is then trucked off and dumped in some, you know, river somewhere. Gross. Right? Yeah, gross. Exactly. Um, so we need to get the advantages of private development, but over a wide scale, in order to create these private cities. Mm. And, and do we? Are there any lessons that we can learn here from that? I mean, what what recommendations would you would you take? from the private city to an American city? So the United States did some advances uh, in this area. Funnily enough, um, Disneyland is a fantastic example of a private city. Yeah. Um, you know, it houses tens of thousands of people on any given day. It has its own security system. It's got its own transportation system. You got the monorail. You know, it's got its own um, underground uh, uh, pneumatic system of tubes for taking you know garbage away. Um, so there are some examples of that. Uh, Reston, which is uh, nearby where we are uh, now, uh, is another example of a privately built city uh, in the United States. So I would like to see more experiments uh, like that. Uh, Google at Sidewalk Labs um, has made a deal with uh, Toronto uh, to uh, create a new uh, test bed for advanced city designs along Toronto's uh, waterfront area. So I'm pretty excited uh, about that. Um, so I think there are some opportunities. We have to allow big experiments, mm. right? If you do it too small, like, uh, you know, block by block, then you have this problem that you don't internalize all the externalities, which is Gurgaon's problem. You don't get a single company able to build sewage and electricity. So you gotta make it on a bigger scale so that a single company has the incentives to produce everything which the city needs. 
Um, and I'd like to see more expense, more examples or experiments on that scale. Who pays for stuff of that scale? Well, actually, this goes back to um, what we were talking about with one of the big problems in the United States right now is that all of the advantages of high tech are flowing into the pockets of uh, absent land, landowners um, because you have a city like San Francisco and San Jose, Silicon Valley. So you got all of these tech workers. They're going there because wages are high. But because you can't build, that pushes up the price of land. So a huge amount of the workers' return to education and skill is actually going to the landowners. So if you can create a city where you would tax that uh, increase in the price of the land, you could then use that to fund all of this infrastructure. Hmm. So it becomes a mutually beneficial and a dynamic system whereby you, know, you build a subway system that increases the value of land near the subway stops and you tax a portion of that value, you value capture a portion of that value to fund the subway system. So everyone is happy then because the landowners, they get some of the value but not all. And you also have a city which is growing over time because you've got lots of revenues to fund all of this infrastructure which benefits everyone. So we're running out of time. And I wanted to, to come back to the, to the big question uh, uh, and in the book that you wrote a few years ago on innovation. And maybe if, if you had, you know, what's your favorite one now? Having more had time to reflect on it more, maybe there are new ideas. If you could, and you could pick two if you want to, but policy recommendations or even just things that individuals can do or think about or 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 influence. What should we be? What should we be thinking about to improving innovation, productivity? Well, let me give you something a little bit different, which we haven't talked about, but which I think is also worth talking about, and that is policing uh, in the United States. So. Um, Quite a bit of my work has shown that policing is really quite effective, that the police really do uh, reduce crime. So much so that it would pay even if we were to double the number of police in the United States. Uh, it would be worth it in terms of the crime of reduction. Really? Yeah, we are actually an under police country, which <laughs> seems weird, but we spend relative to other countries, in Europe, for example, we spend less on police and more on prisons. Okay, yeah. And I'd like to see us spend more on police, avoid the crime altogether, and then we can spend less on prisons. Because prisons, I think, actually are not that all that effective. They're not as effective as, as police. So part of the problem we have in the United States is that, A, we're under-policed, but we're also badly policed. And we are badly policed often in the areas which are most under-policed, right? So there is, I think, a problem with um, policing and race um, and policing and minorities and stop and frisk and the use of fines, uh, these kind of, frankly, bullshit fines to support the police, which is becoming more common. So, you know, tinted windows, you go, people, the police will stop you and fine you for having the wrong tint on your windows or for not mowing your lawn properly. Hmm. There's a whole bunch of these really outrageous uses of fines and forfeitures to support local government activity. And I think that's a big problem. So I think that's a kind of a, uh, a dilemma which we face in the United States, but which is solvable. The dilemma being that we are both under-policed and poorly policed, and in order to get more police, we've got to convince people that it's going to be good policing. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. yeah. More so the nonsense. Yeah. It, it, exactly. Less of the nonsense. You know, in Chicago last weekend, it was like 50 shootings, 10 people died. Yeah. That's outrageous. That should yeah. not happen. That is not necessary. Um, and more we, police would stop that. More police would stop that, yes. More police would stop that. Or prevent it. Prevent it, exactly. That's a better way of putting it, right? Yeah, exactly. So what my work with John Click shows is that more police on the street means the crime never happens. Right. It's not that you get more arrests. That actually, arrests actually go down. It's that just having more police on the street means that the crime doesn't happen in the first place. Um, so what we do today, it's absurd. We 
we make it unlikely that you're caught, but when you are caught, we make the penalty so hot. <laughs> really give it to you. Yeah, we really, you know, yeah. we really give it to you, and I think that's a problem. So that's 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 deterrence. That's a, I guess an overemphasis on the deterrence theory of of police. Well, the wrong way of putting it, I suppose, because you're saying the presence of police acts as a different kind of deterrent. Right. So uh, you know, you can deter in a, in a variety of ways. You can make the deterrence more sure, more certain, right? Which is like having more police. Uh, on the street, or you can make it more severe, right? Mm -hmm. And we've gone for severity, yeah, right? And I think we should go for certainty. Yeah. Uh, so if people are more sure that they will be caught, um, that actually is much more effective. And it's just like parenting, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. If if you if every single parenting guide would tell you, will tell you that punish quickly but lightly. Yep. Right, not ignore it, you know, for the first five times it happens, and then go crazy on the sixth time, you yeah. know, randomly. Uh, we need to make punishment more certain. And I am somewhat optimistic about this in that uh, both the right and the left are coming to this point of view. Hmm. Um, so you know, even Donald Trump passed a crime law which reduces um, federal imprisonment. It's a start. But it, it shows you that there isn't this pushback from the right, which you might have seen 20 years ago. The right actually seems to have come around on, hey, maybe mass incarceration um, isn't working. Now, we need to be careful. We need to tread really carefully because we have to get both sides on board, both the left and the right. And if we go too far one way or the other, then we're going to lose one of those sides, and we're going to lose all hope of uh, fixing the problem. Who, who, who's the model? The, what, what country does it best? What country does it best? That's a good, that's There's a good lot of talk of Japan having a lot of police, right? Singapore, I feel like I've traveled there a couple of times. There's pretty certain people are scared of being caught right, at things. Right. Maybe just yeah, yeah. the rules are kind of wacky. Yeah. Yeah, Japan is very weird because. Um, Nobody knows quite what's going on in Japan because, like, you have, like, 95% of people confess. Yeah. And okay. that doesn't seem quite right. Yeah, that's so, not coming here. Yeah. Soon. But some of the European countries, I think, do do quite well. Um, and it seems that, you know, people make fun of um, some of these European prisons, which look sort of like dorm rooms. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not quite what we think of as U.S. prisons. Yeah. But... That actually seems to punish pretty pretty well. Um, I mean, I would be, you and I would find that plenty of punishment. You know, yeah, sure. Right? And it, it does seem like um, a bad idea to me to brutalize people who we know are going eventually to get back out on the street. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And treating them a little bit more uh, humanely and preparing them for a return or a reintegration with society, right? So I think it's nonsense that, that um, we don't allow uh, uh, ex-felons to vote, right? I mean, you can, argue, you can argue about whether they should vote while they're in prison. I think that's going too far. I think that's a case where we're going to lose the right, okay, lose the, the right side of the yeah. political. But once you have served your time, that is the time to reintegrate with society. We say, okay, you've served your time, now come back. Instead, what we say is, no, 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 it's not over. You've got to follow your parole you know, board. You've got to do whatever your parole officer tells you. You've got to take all these drug tests. You've got to spit. You've got to piss. You know, and you can't get welfare. Uh, you can't get into government housing. All kinds of things uh, you didn't realize when you're... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you didn't realize it, so it can't possibly have you, yeah. influenced any deterrent. And now it actually makes it more difficult to live a normal life. Mm. You're trying, you're out of prison, you would like to reintegrate with society, but society is telling you, no, you are still an other, right? You, you, you're still not, you're not a citizen because you can't vote. Okay, and you can't get you know a food stamps. I mean, it's insane. It's insane. So I believe in punishment. Okay, I don't have any problem with punishing, but there needs to it needs to stop at some point, and we say, okay, let's try again. Now you're one of us. 
join back with us, reintegrate into society, and become a model, you know, a citizen again, right? Reclaim your right to be a citizen. You have been punished. Now, once again, you're a citizen, and I think that would be a much better way of approaching crime. So what, what's the upside on that? So what would your prediction be? Let's say you, 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 got, you got a chance to draft a bill, goes through both houses, signed by the president. What's, your, what's the economic outcome or social outcome? What variable do you watch? Uh, and I don't, I don't just mean uh, it arrest rates, but what's, what's, the, you know, what's the externality to society on that, on this policy? Yeah, I think it's big. Um, it means people can live in more places. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there are large parts of uh, cities which many people don't want to live, yep. right? Uh, because crime is too high, you know. Uh, people then are going to complain about gentrification, blah, 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 blah. It's another story, I think, where we're going to lose people. Um, gentrification is a good thing, yep. okay? Yep. Um, but, yes, we can pacify, if, if crime were lower and the streets were more passive, the cities, especially the inner cities, uh, would become much more pleasant places to live. And that is a way of reducing inequality. Mm. Um, race relations would be much better. I mean, this does mass incarceration, um, harms minorities uh, more than it does whites, and it sends a continuous message that there are two classes of people in society and you're in the lower class uh, when you cannot escape as a you know a black man when you cannot escape no matter what you do um, being pulled over by the police that is sending a message right and I think that's a message that it's not necessary for us to send in order to be a low crime society right there are other ways of, of doing uh, these kinds of things uh, so I think on a whole bunch of measures on education, like if you see a way out of the inner city, um, if you see a way out, then you're less likely to become a criminal in the first place, right? So uh, I think yeah. uh, lower crime, uh, better city living, better streets, uh, get education back under control, because in some places, you know, it is, I mean, it's crazy that in almost all of the schools now, you know, have uh, metal detectors, right? Yeah. Some of them in the, in the suburbs, like where I live, because people are crazy scared about, you know, terrorists, which is insane, or the, you know, the shooter. And then others of them have, you know, metal detectors because they're scared of the students. Yeah. You know, neither of those is a good solution mm. uh, to the problem at all. Um, but that's one area where I think we actually could have some success. My guest today is Alex Tabarrok. Alex, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.